Have you ever seen a dry fly swirl up for your fly but not take it? Have you had issues trying to keep your dry fly from sinking while on the water? And do you know what skittering is all about and how to do it? Today we have the owner of one of the great fly shops in the Northeast, the Hungry Trout, and today you're going to find out how to fish the Osable River with dry flies. This is the Wet Fly Swing Podcast where we show you the best places to travel to for fly fishing, how to find the best resources and tools to prepare for that trip, and what you can do to give back to the fish species we love. How's it going? I'm Dave, host of the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. I've been fly fishing since I was a kid. I grew up around a fly shop and have created one of the largest fly fishing podcasts in this country. I've also interviewed more of the greatest fly anglers than just about anyone in the world. Today, Evan Botcher is on the show to take us into the Osable River and the amazing beauty of the Adirondacks. You are going to discover the three big tips you need to land more fish while fishing dry flies this year. This is especially true if you are fishing pocket water. You're going to find out how to choose the right fly size, how far off the bank you should be fishing, and the exact technique you need to skitter a fly to entice the fly and the fish to take. Plus, we find out why a high rod tip can be the game changer on the Osable. Here it is, Evan Botcher from HungryTrout.com. How are you doing, Evan? I'm doing well, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, spending some time to come on this podcast. You know, I think the Hungry Trout, uh, the Osable are big names. We've actually done a podcast in the past with... Uh, with Rachel Finn, which was a really amazing podcast way back in the day when we first got going. Um, we could talk a little bit about that. But also we've had a bunch of listeners recommend you just, you know, through the podcast. And I think, I can't remember the last person that noted you, but we're kind of given, finally put this together. I know you're busy. So thanks for taking time to do this. No, it's my pleasure. So good. Well, I want to start out with, like we said, you know, I want to get into the Hungry Trout. I want to talk about how people can catch more fish, maybe plan a trip heading up there. But before we get there, let's bring it back to fly fishing first. How did you get into fly fishing? What's your first memory? Um, so I actually grew up on the Hungry Trout property. Uh, my family purchased the Hungry Trout in uh, 1981. And at the time, it wasn't like a fly fishing uh, themed resort, right? It was more like a motel with a small restaurant um still on the Osable river so it inherently was a good place for anglers to co when my dad bought it he was a uh angler at the time and also really just getting into the sport so he had the vision of really nailing down the hungry trout as a, a fly fishing destination in itself and inherently getting involved with the fishery and and really pushing that whole experience so i grew up from day one, living on that resort and living on the Osable. So it was always kind of just in my orbit until I was old enough to, you know, dive in myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I have a similar experience. My dad, you know, I grew up around a fly shop and, you know, as far as I can remember back as a kid, that's all I remember. So I, I kind of feel, but I never liked the lodge, like actually being on the river. We didn't have that. So what was that like actually as a kid growing up on the river? You must have probably you take it for granted for a little bit, then you realize what you have. Oh, 100%. And that's when I was growing up, the river, like it was right in our backyard. So most of our, my experience with the river was we would like tie knots and ropes and go and hang in the boulders and the current and, you know, play around in the river and, and not fishing way. But I actually remember growing up, I'd be doing that and I'd always have these bugs all over my hands. <laughs> And I was like kind of grossed out. I'm like, what is this stuff? And I, you know, come to find out that they were just hundreds of stonefly shucks, which is what our river is like quite known for, for an East Coast fishery is big bugs. Um, but yeah, that was like my earliest childhood memory that relates to fly fishing was probably the amount of insects I'd have on my hands when I would like be swimming in the river. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it was cool. That's so but it cool. was good. Yeah, it was. Uh, and taking for granted i moved away at 17 for college i have family in colorado so i ended up there and it was like day one when i realized like wait a minute there's something really unique about where i grew up and what what i the environment i grew up in um and it was repeated back to me by everybody that i met They're like you grew up where doing what <laughs> your family does what like that's amazing and i was like yeah that is amazing actually i couldn't wait to leave, but you're right. That was great. <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you realize, and then when did you, so when did you go back and stay for good back at the, you know, the hungry trout? Yeah. I, uh, you know, I fished a lot as a kid. I grew up on the resort and, you know, the fly fishing scene was always a part of, uh, my family and my dad and uncles and everyone were big anglers. So I had always fished, but with everything else going on in, you know, high school sports, the whole routine, it's something I kind of did on the side and would do with my dad. Um, I didn't really dive in on my own until I was about 17 when I got to Colorado, mostly because when I got there, that was like the closest thing. That was like the closest culture I could relate to, you know? I got out there, the Animus River ran right through Durango and it was like, okay, I'm a, I bet that's familiar to me. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of where I gravitated toward. So when I got out there, I was, I really dove in there and I started exploring and there's so much water out there to explore that it, it really just became the focus after a while. And what was great about it is since I really got into it away when I would come home, my hometown was like a new frontier in a way. So I got back here and it was my home river was now a new river to explore, just being more mature and having uh, all of the tools and skills to dive in. Hmm. It really was when I moved back home after, uh, you know, I was, I moved back at probably 27 or 28 and it was pretty clear like, okay, this is this is really neat. So it was actually, when I was a, ch- a kid, I would get dropped off the school bus because, you know, owning the motel and we have some restaurants and the fly shop and stuff. It, my parents were super busy all the time and getting dropped off the school bus. I used to have to wait in the fly shop an hour or two until my mom would return back from whatever work or errands, you name it. So I actually would spend time in the fly shop with the current manager at the time and they would always be talking me into like, Hey, this is what you got to do. You got to do this. You got to do that. Oh, let me show you. uh, Let me teach you how to make a a nail knot. Let me like, you know, and all and I couldn't have cared less. I was like eight, you know? So I was like, okay, whatever you say, when's my mom get home? But all of that, it did soak in. Right. And it's like the term my mom uses. My mom's not an angler, but she says she fishes by osmosis. So she could tell you like what the hatch was. She could tell you Little things like that, having never even done it, just because it was in her orbit so often. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. No, I, and I think that, you know, with your dad, so I, it's interesting because I keep going back to thinking about some of my history where I, a lot of what I learned early on, I mean, things have changed a lot, you know, since I was a kid, you know, but a lot of it I learned from my dad. Is that the same with you? Or do, do, it sounds like maybe you learned from some other people. Is, yeah, is your, I had a you know, I, background. Yeah. No question. I had a whole, um, there was a whole team at the Hungry Trout that really, was doing this. I mean, Rachel Finn was a guide there from day one. The fly shop opened in 1991. Uh, her and her husband, Jeff Kirschman, were um, the first guides that worked out of the Hungry Trout. So when I was six, there was a fly shop and a guide scene, and they were always up at the bar. They were in the restaurants and flowing around property. But also my dad was like really obsessed angler for a while and still is like his main focus now at 78 is bass fishing. He's got a boat and he's out there Mm. hucking rubber all day. So (laughs) I would, you know, just be in tow with him on all of his little fishing adventures and our vacations growing up were always fishing based. So, you know, I was pretty young, like videotaping him, catching his first tarpon, getting you know, sun poisoning in, uh, <laughs> in Belize and, yeah. you know, little <laughs> and stuff like that. Get me out of here. Once again, I'm too young to really do it myself. But in hindsight, I mean, they're just priceless experiences that I was able to witness when I was a young, <sighs> young kid. Great. Yeah, it was special. So um, needless to say, my son is kind of in the same boat with, you know, the fly rod and the, and the fishing equipment's always in tow. Um, so it's our, my, our life is still like, totally entrenched in the the fishing routine yeah uh, so yeah i i learned a lot of it just by and since he was so into fishing himself the teaching aspect was more 
following him around, doing these trips, going fishing. And he would hand me the rod and say, okay, we're here, start fishing. And then he would fish. So a lot of mine was just like watching and learning by observation rather than, you know, taking classes or having guides or things like that was really just watching um, and learning and and putting what I would see into practice, like how to mend. It's like, well, watching him, oh, that's how you mend. So now, you know, some of my fishing habits, good and bad, were like are kind of a mirror of his style and how he would approach a stream and, you know, generally overly aggressive and loud and not quite patient enough, but that's, you know, kind of by nature, (laughs) you know, everyone, how everyone fishes is kind of reflective of them, of their mind. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. No, that's, that was really cool. And, and how did your, so the, the hungry, you said 1981, when do you think, you know, how did your dad do it? It sounds like maybe he made this thing kind of famous or do you, or was it more the river? Like how did it become the hungry trout? It was both, you know, the uh, Sable river in itself is, uh, a very special uh, stream in its topography, uh, its history. You know, it was one of the destination streams for a lot of the founding fathers of the East Coast fishing coming up from the Catskills and the city. And there's a lot of great literature about the stream from the early 1900s with Ray Bergman and um, all those players, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, Fran Betters is also a local kind of folklore local legend who's got a lot of famous fly patterns that were established on the river um but my dad brought a um a model to the corridor that hadn't existed yet having traveled through montana and and done the fishing lodge thing elsewhere and there was another lodge in town that was kind of doing the fishing package routine Uh, i forget the name of it it's changed hands a few times now and no longer exists but the first motel he managed here, he was an angler, and this guy told him, "Well, Jerry, you should do, you should do this. Like it, it works great for us. There's a lot of people here who come for fishing." And uh, once he bought the hungry trout, he really nailed that down, and it became the focus, which married with the, his passion for fishing. You know, so they bought it in '81. In 1990, they built uh, R.F. McDougall's pub which is uh, hmm. named after the rat face McDougal. And that was a fishing themed bar, you know, once again, like a hundred feet from some of the most spectacular uh, water that I've seen anywhere. It's really special. And I'll, I'll explain that shortly, but, uh, and then the following year or two years later, it was all in like that 1990, 92 timeframe. The old, there was used to be an old horse barn on property right at the entrance to the property. And, that was converted into the fly shop. Mm-hmm. So within a, a couple year period, it became a much more well-rounded product for anglers to come with, with the pub. We have a fine dining restaurant. We have the motel. We're right on the river. We have about a you know couple thousand feet of, I, mean, I think it's a thousand feet or so of river frontage and the fly shop. So by 1992 or 93, it really was kind of a one-stop shop for anglers coming into the Adirondacks to fish the Osable, which everyone had heard about, but we were able to, you know, dive in and, and kind of create our own little community using that, you know, and and that's really what it's become. Even today it's, we're guiding anglers and there's people that I've been uh, seeing every year in passing in the shop and on property that have been coming up here since I, before I can remember since I was, you know, oh, wow. five, you know, That's so cool. Yeah. So 30, 30 something years, we've got guys and, uh, that have been coming and, and they, and they still do. So it's still in rotation now. Um, so he really just knew he had a, he had a vision. He had experienced that sort of lifestyle elsewhere. And it was, uh, the opportunity was here and he, he really jumped on it. That's great. And then you, of course, have the river, the, the Osable. What is it about? Maybe talk about that, the Osable versus some other rivers in that, that region. How is it yeah, different? Well, than, yeah. Well, East Coast is, um, people don't associate the East Coast as a very mountainous region, you know? Yeah. You hear like Appalachian Trail and, you know, maybe the White Mountains, but they're, they're not these grand ranges that are 
comparable to what you see in like Montana, et cetera, uh, especially in New York, you know? So New York has some great fisheries, especially in the Catskills, but every river has got its own personality, you know, and they're all very unique and they all fish a certain way. And the Osable is a very dramatic, uh, has a pretty dramatic personality in that sense. It's a very steep river. Yeah, it drops about 3,500 uh, vertical feet in 35 miles per se. Wow. So it's very steep. It is almost all, you know, out of 30 something miles, I think seven or eight of them are what I would consider flat water. The rest is all pocket water. So it's riddled with waterfalls and really big plunge pools and just classic pocket water, right? Like what you see when you're, mm -hmm. uh, when you're out west. So it's bouldery, it's steep, it's, and you don't get a lot of that on the East Coast. The East Coast has a lot of um, more pools and riffles and low, lower gradient, which makes it great for dry fly fishing and the whole routine. But um, the Osable offers like a, a very different experience in that sense. And it's also on either side of the banks, you're looking up like 3,500, 4,000 feet elevation gain from the river you're standing in. Oh, wow. So you're looking up, when you're in the river, you look up and you're, there's like canyons, you're in the canyon sort of thing, or describe that a little bit? Properly. Proper canyons, mountains. Like, you know, to get to the top of that mountain, there's a huge hiking circuit around here as well called the, oh, the wow. Adirondack, yep. called the 46ers. There's 46 peaks above 4,000 feet. So there's like, hiking is really the Adirondacks like number one oh, right. uh, activity because- and they're hard hikes. I actually started doing them um, this fall just because I was like, I needed some goal, right? I needed something to check off. So, and the hikes are hard, man. They're rugged, brutal hikes hmm. because the mountains, they're like, I mean, 4,000 feet elevation gain. That's what like a lot of 40 or a lot of 14ers in Colorado share that same elevation gain. Yeah. That is the thing about the, the West versus the East is that a lot of people think like, oh, it's only this tall. But the fact is- it's 3,500 feet. And if you're climbing Colorado or any of the Western states, it's probably a similar uh, distance you're climbing, right? Properly. No, without a, without a doubt. I mean, we're starting from 800 vertical feet going up to 4,000 plus. So it's all relative, you know? And that's what I try to explain to people when I would live out there. They're like, oh, you're from New York. What's it like living in the mountains? I was like, well, I actually always lived in the mountains. And they look at you like you have, <laughs> you're like, what? They have no clue, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. But East Coasters do, like New Yorkers do. And our our main clientele is like Montreal, New York, pretty much the six hour circumference around around the region, you know. We're a big drivable destination for those population centers, which are big. I mean, Montreal, millions of people, yeah. New York, millions right. of people, Boston, can all of Connecticut, you name it. Like we're like a, a real destination for an easy weekend or week long trip that's accessible from a lot of a lot of people, right? So, but the Osable, it's just all and all of that sounds great and you know the how dramatic the mountains are, but at the end of the day, it's just an incredibly beautiful and scenic corridor. Like it is a draw dropping area to hang out in. And I've been around, you know, I'm not an old buck yet but i'm getting there and i've traveled to a lot of places and every year i sit around the river and like when the light hits right you're like holy this place is really pretty like straight up like there's just no way around it it's a very scenic corridor and as we know like fishermen like that adventure they like the that aesthetic of the sport it's a very beautiful sport and you couple that with a 30 foot waterfall and some changing leaves in october like forget about it you don't need much more than that. Imagine yourself surrounded by pristine waters, towering mountains, and the thrill of landing a trophy fish like the majestic Arctic grayling or the elusive bull trout. Take a look for yourself at nradventures.com slash wetflyswing and discover the northern Rockies like never before. That's N as in northern, R as in Rockies, adventures.com. You support this podcast by checking in at nradventures.com. Dreaming of battling a giant rainbow trout in Alaska's untouched rivers? Turn that dream into a reality with Fishhound Expeditions. 
Immerse yourself in the heart of Alaska, where epic landscapes and legendary fish await. Visit fishhoundexpeditions.com and mention this podcast to begin your adventure. Fishhound Expeditions, your gateway to the ultimate Alaskan fishing experience. No, you painted a great picture here. And then you mentioned earlier the stone flies and some of the hatches. I want to hear about that a little bit on, you know, just the throughout the year. Like, again, we always go back to these things. We're planning a lot of trips around the country. And this is one maybe hopefully we can get up to get some of our listeners out your way. But what is, um, you know, best time, right? Are there a bunch of best times or is there a good hatch throughout the year that people really focus on? Yeah. My favorite hatch is when the stone flies are out. And that's generally like the second, third of May through June. And then we have a lot of different species of stones. So there's kind of always some sort of active stonefly routine all the way through the fall. So we fish an insane amount of big bugs, a lot of Western uh, fly assortments. You know, people just think East Coast is very like, you know, classic flies, and you know, Adams and Quill Gordons and this stuff. It's like, yeah, that's there's an element for that. But these days we find ourselves fishing more chubby Chernobyls and girdle bugs or pets, rubber legs, whatever y'all want to call it, right? Yeah. Um, but we fish uh, a lot of Fran Better's old patterns, our sable wolves, our sable bombers, and they're like mm. size six and eight dry flies. If we're fishing a 14, that's small. So that stonefly routine just brings a really unique and fun element of of how you fish it, uh, especially for the East Coast. But starting uh, about the second week of May, if you follow us online, you'll you'll always hear me chiming off like, hey, second week of May, it's almost without fail that we'll, our Hendrix and Hatch, as long as our weather patterns align, we don't get some major blowout, then our Hendrix and Hatch generally starts the second week of May. And that goes for a week, week and a half strong, that it'll marry with the March Brown we get a really strong sedge caddis that mixes in there. That'll transition into stoneflies, yellow sallies, some sulfurs oh, yeah. through the early June. Um, it's kind of funny and sad at the same time because a lot of fisheries everywhere in the world, I don't care where what continent you're from, are struggling with some element of climate change, right? Yeah. And our river is no exception to that. So if we had had this podcast when I took the shop over in 2011, we'd be having a very different conversation about the hatch schedule. Uh, our hatches, just like everywhere else I've experienced and heard from and spoke with, we don't quite have as complex a hatch schedule as we once had. The catching is still good and the fishing is still good, but the clouds of green drakes, now you'll see like some, right? Mm. And why is that? What is going? I mean, I know the you know there's less rain, there's more rain. Why do you think that there's less bugs um, now? And are, and are you losing hatches altogether? Like well, in our river, is all I can really speak toward is um, we've had a handful of extreme weather events the last decade or two that have really kind of scoured out the river. Some pretty major flooding. Mm, gotcha. And then you have you don't have that like consistently cool kind of drawn out transition from winter to summer. Spring is kind of real. Spring is really temperamental now. So you'll get, you'll get heavy rain. You'll get eighty degree. You're like, oh, the March brown hatch is about to start, and it'll be sunny. It'll be sunny and, and not even hot, but it'll be sunny and warm for like a week. And the hatch doesn't start till eight o'clock at night because the sun's pounding on the river, and it's just the environment that these bugs need to flourish is just very erratic, you know. Right. And it's everywhere. It's, you know, we, we fish Argentina every winter and host some trips down there with set fly fishing. And though, and they, t they tell us the same thing. It's still spectacular fishing. But, uh, I think that's important to touch base on because fisheries and the business, it's not always going to be this. It's not all like, Hey, this is a perfect scenario. Every, everywhere has challenges. And, and this is something that as an industry we deal with. So I, I just wanted to chime in on that. Yeah, I think it's great. And, and I think the point too, again, it's, I think, again, I, I never like to paint a doomsday picture of things because I think there's a lot of great groups out there doing great things. And I think we have, we, I think we can do some awesome stuff, but I think it all, it's also a reminder that, you know what, 
make sure you do this stuff if you want to do it before, you know, like before you're too old or, you know, the stuff goes away because you never know. I mean, this, you know, things could get worse and then they could get better, but I, exactly. I feel like the traveling, right, is the time is now. Exactly. And if you're not using the platform to share that knowledge, then you're doing your river a disservice, whether it sounds bad or not. You have to have that, that conversation comes into play. And in my opinion, especially with hatches, because that's a very tangible event and a very romantic event that, you really have to like be in the right place at the right time for now where it used to be like, you know, you just show up for the whole month of May and June and you'll get some bugs. And you know, that's not always the case anymore. Yeah. Gotcha. So May and June. Yeah. May and June. It's, it's, that's the prime time. That's the prime time. So what are the stone, you mentioned the yellow size. What are the, the species? Do you guys have, I know like out West you have the big giant stone flies. I mean, what are the different uh, species or there's a few or just one or two? Yeah. And I have a very elementary uh, jargon when it comes to stone. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Just it's give like, me the common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We get big black ones. We get small golden ones. We get big golden ones. You'll actually have like random times. You'll get like salmon flies that land. Yeah. Exa- oh, you will. So you will see salmon flies too. Yeah. But just like, just the, um, like, it's not like an event of salmon flies, but they'll have like, clearly they'll have the red collar, you know, that kind of separates them. And how big are those? What's the biggest stone fly, like say nymph or dry that you would be fishing size wise? Oh, like a size six. Yeah. Size six. Yeah. Large. Like I had a stone fly land on my finger last year. That was the length of my pinky. Yeah. That's it. Like yep. huge. You know, it's a big fly, you know, but we get them um, like if, if you turn one over, um, majority of the ones that we find are more in that like kind of golden uh, family. Yep. And uh, SUNY Plattsburgh, uh, State University of New York, Plattsburgh, did a really neat study a couple years ago where they cataloged the stone flies and they found like over 100 species. Oh, cool. They did. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking about how to take this conversation further. I think that that might be something maybe dig into that. People can learn a little more about the the bugs and hatches out there. Oh, it's huge. The bugs, like, um, there was a, like, that, the stonefly routine is not, uh, I noticed that not really being much affected. Same with the caddis. Like, those two um, hatches are, they're strong. They're sticking with it. And I didn't mention blue-winged olives. That's kind of a, sure. uh, a common one. Like, we get most... East Coast river hatches, right? The best ones are caddis stoneflies, Hendrickson's, March Browns. In the summertime, we get kind of your, um, we get what's called a fish fly, which is like a Dobson fly adult. It's all black. It's got a white wing. Everyone thinks they're stoneflies, but if you get dorky about it, it's really a, a Helgramite adult called a fish fly. And we use the same thing. We just fish a chubby Chernobyl, but in black. We get a lot of uh, flying ant hatches as we transition into the fall season. So the flying ant event and uh, a lot of terrestrials, beetles, you know, pick your variety of different worm or mop fly. And then as we transition into fall, blue-winged olive, olives, caddis, um, and our big fall hatch, which is quite strong, is the isonychia. So we get a lot of isos or, you know, your mahogany done whatever you, you want to call it, but it's essentially just a slate drake, uh, can be more mahogany a body or a kind of a gray body. But that's like our strongest, uh, starting like second week, September, end of the first week of September, that'll take us through, uh, mid October mixed in with caddis and blueing olives and you name it. And some of our other rivers in the region are still like really fine with the uh, bug life. They just have a very different dynamic, little different watershed. So I was speaking more toward the Osable as facing those hatch challenges oh, um, right. as opposed gotcha. to some of our other, you know, kind of neighboring streams there. And we do get trichos. Oh, trichos. I, I, okay. I always forget trichos. I have to, I have to asterisk that in there, but that's one that's of all the hatches that we used to really bank on and loved fish are, uh, you know, kind of latter summer trico hatch has suffered quite a bit. And that one's, that's a sad one. But they appear time to time. And when they do, you're just pumped because as we know, a little trico flurry is always a good time. Well, my guess is, I know there's people probably come around from all around the country, the world, but you know, I guess there's a lot of people, like you said, that drive in from all the cities around and I'm sure they could, you know, like whenever time of year call you and say, hey, what's going on? And then within, you know, four or five, six hours, something like that, right? They could be there and be fishing. Oh yeah. So that's And we do really well actually like, 
we do well when the um like if international travels down we do or like you know it's a recession year yeah we're a lot of people oh i'm not going to montana i'm going to the adirondacks yeah uh oh i can't go to italy this summer so i'm gonna get uh a guide you know twice a week for the month of july we're like no problem exactly right so we're yeah. we're you like have that cover totally we actually do well at those kind of downturns because we're so accessible and it's such a more affordable option than going on a, a big destination trip well and, um, and it is de- well i love that you say destination because rachel fit i wanted to just give a shout out to rachel because you know episode 72 you know it was a long time ago we've done we're over 600 episodes now so you know it, it's been a long time ago but i love that episode because I think she cussed in that episode like a hundred times. It was so many, you know, but it was so awesome because (laughs) because her style, right? She had the stogie, you know, we were talking about that, but she talked about the hang and it's still to this day. We talked about it on another trip we did out to Yellowstone with one of our uh, group of people. It was amazing. And we were talking about the hang and, and, and she kept saying that it's all about the hang, you know, it's all about the hang. And I feel, I asked her destination, like, what's your destination? You know, like, and she said, Hey man, like destination is wherever, you know, whatever it is for you. Like it might be yeah, that man. backyard, right? And yeah. so I love that her take. And I think that I actually, that that episode, we actually got a little bit of hate mail, which was kind of funny because she was so, uh, I don't know what the word about Rachel is, but it was just um, just out in front of you. You know I mean? Most of the, yeah. obviously most of the people loved it, but they're, you know, so I think that, talk about Rachel, like what makes her so unique? You know, it's funny you ask that because when she, you know, she had her um, movie that came out this summer after you're gone about the passing of, um, her husband Jeff. Who oh, was, wow! I didn't see that. Oh, dude, you gotta chime into that ASAP. It is spectacular. Okay. Wow. Uh, it was done by the Fly Lords crew. Oh, nice! It won best film for I think at the um, IFTD. I think it won the best film for the the film tour, etc. But oh, it's a it's an amazing, you know, really uh, heartfelt video about how she's coping with the stuff that's happened to her. You know, she's a cancer survivor. Her husband. Right after she got over that hurdle, her husband got cancer and passed within uh, six months. And I had grown up with Jeff, her husband, as being the, uh, you know, he's like one of those, he's like the dude when the apocalypse comes, you just run to his house. You know, you're like, okay, I got Jeff in my corner. I'll be fine. He was a badass man. Like, (sighs) he's like just those classic guides. You just can't, they don't make them like that anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. So- Rachel is like, she's been through some stuff the last decade, but it doesn't slow her down at all. She's hmm. just a really tenacious, uh, very intelligent. I think a lot of like the way her personality and the way it comes through, uh, she's a very intelligent woman and emotionally intelligent and can understand the bigger picture of life, right? Hmm. Yeah. I uh, like that destination comment, like, it's where you are, Matt. There is no yeah. destination, Matt. Right. Yep. And that's like, she understands that about all sorts of trials and tribulations and death. And and it's totally true. That's what I love it's about totally it. It's totally true. She came out and I basically asked her a question, which I've, you know, now think about. And she was right. It's like, hey, it's not about getting to Belize, even though that would be great to go to. You know, it's about just the experience, right? And the hang, right? That's yeah. what it was. No question. Well, dude, like, and I, I've known her since I was six. Hmm. So I, I don't have, and, you know, she lives half a mile up the road from me. So I have a very, uh, I don't want to say like different, but it's not like I just met her and I have these like right. reflections upon this character, you know? Yeah. You you know her, you know her better than I, about I, as I, well yeah. as anybody. Yeah. So it's hard to kind of describe her, but uh, I, I just look at her. She's just very, she's a very intelligent woman and her perception on things is not altered by what people think or what you should do. She does the right thing. Like about water bottles, right? Like no no disposable water bottles. She says that and eight years go by, she's never had a disposable water bottle again. She'll take, you know, our jobs rely around taking people trout fishing. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. And it'll be peak week and the water will get to like 68 degrees, 66 degrees, not even 70 yet. And she's like yelling from the rooftops about temps and she was, she's canceling trips. She's when other people, most guides I know wouldn't do that because they're too worried about their money. You know, oh, this yeah. is their job. She puts the fishery and she does the right thing first every time because it's the right thing, right? Uh, integrity. And she calls it out and she lives it 
and it's not it's not for anything other than it's just the right thing to do. She's not doing it to be recognized. Right. I love that. She doesn't fish to be recognized. She doesn't do social media to be recognized. She doesn't you know what I mean? So yeah, it's uh I do. I do. It's a very refreshing personality to have in your corner because it's very it's grounding. It's like yeah. just kind of shows you, okay, I have this example and thankfully so because it's easy to get swept up in in that kind of the world you know? and, and, yeah, and all that crap. Yeah, and as you recognize when you interviewed her, like there is no with Rachel. Nope. She's a very unique, independent, uh, and intelligent woman, and she does the right thing, and sh- and she's living her life out of passion, and because of that, that's her success has all stemmed from that, and not from these uh, you know little Instagrammers that are basically just cinematographers exactly. that learn how to fly fish. Exactly, and you see the you know again. I don't see there's stuff out there, right? Social media. But you see the reverse of, you know, the, the exact opposite of Rachel. Like some of these times you see like a, a, a woman in a bikini, right? They're, they're obviously trying to do that sort of thing on social media. And I feel like there's not that much of it out there just because I think most fly anglers understand like, hey, that's just BS, right? I mean, Rachel is the true, right, essence of fly fishing. I mean, what, what's your take? I kind of want to dig into that. I know this is a sidetrack, but I'm just curious about your take on that social media wise. Do you see a lot of that stuff or do you see yeah. more Rachel? No, I don't see because the Rachels are not doing the look at me Mm. experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, They're just not doing it. And because of that, like the real OGs are are not like to be like a real word of mouth. I don't want to reduce somebody to product or whatever, but to be like a to be like a, a word of mouth product guide shop, you name it holds so much more clout to me than someone who's has a new Sony alpha and a marketing degree. And now they, they get into the fly fishing scene and they're getting 40,000 views on these videos and, and they're really not offering anything to anybody. Right. There's like, I, I, I call them uh they're like a doom scrolling fly fisherman. Because if people weren't sitting there just doom scrolling on their phone, they wouldn't even know they exist, right? No. So there's this like there's this tier of of Instagram and uh, social media, and you know, and, and at the end of the day, also I don't hate on them too much because no, it is kind of inspiring. They're trying, to, it, they're trying and they're inspired, right? And it's hard to be inspired. So if you are and you're grinding that out and you're making the content and you are bringing people to the sport and maybe the people who see that then come and visit us. So I'm not really, I'm not trying to say that in like a negative light. Yeah. No, I uh, agree. It's just the reality of being in this day and age in a culture where, you know, when I grew up and I, I'm sounding like I'm like some wise man. Right. But I did right. <laughs> grow up. I, I didn't grow up before that and was involved in the industry. Like before that stuff took hold, even when I took the shop over in 2011, like, I started the Facebook account. I started the Instagram account. And all it would be was like some grainy picture of like a rod and say, hey, we have fly rods. Yep. Right. And then right. and it hasn't changed much. Like <laughs> my Instagram is <laughs> terrible. I don't I don't I can't wrap my round my mind around doing that or hiring somebody to do that. Uh spent, you know, and I know I should, but it's just there's just like so many layers to business these days. It's and being a cinematographer to me is is not one of them. You know. Well, you know, I think my take on it is that you know, out of everybody, businesses, you know, whatever, you got your specialty, like the fly lords. You said, I mean, those guys are doing some great stuff. They're obviously they've got their little niche, and you know, and that's not what we do. You know, I mean, the podcast is kind of what we do, and you have your own thing. You know, you guys have this thing up in the hungry trout, and you know, and, and nobody can really replicate your thing because it's you guys. You've built this right, but. Right. But I think it's all good because people are just out there doing it, trying. And I think that there's nothing wrong with trying and failing, you know, along the way. And yeah. eventually I'm sure these people are going to be good. Yeah. And I want to clarify, I have no, um, like if you're a proper like media company, like Fly Lords, that's a, a product that they're like, it's an industry that they're, uh, it's their job, you know? Yep. What gets me a little more riled up is the people that they're not even really in the industry they're just hobbyists that are trying to be influencers 
Mm. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, there's a fine line between like who is this person? Like they're not even they're not even like in the industry, but they're now they're some authority because they have like a lot of attention online. It's kind of weird, right? There's that there's nuance to it a little bit. But like I said, I I really it it inspires me sometimes of like, hey, I I need to do that or I need to focus more on these elements to yeah. help my business. And so and and that inspiration, seeing people do that, wake up every day with the grind, I do respect that. Like people are are successful doing so. And it's just funny to be in orbit of that. Cause this will be my thirteenth year running the shop here. And I'm like man, like things have changed, you know? Yeah. And I'm not an old buck and I'm watching it and it's like, wow, things have changed. This is a kind of a funny dynamic. It is. I'm glad we went down that track a little bit. I think that's good. Um, I want to bring it back into just the fishing kind of uh, quickly as we talked about it. You know, and again, I'm thinking like if people are listening now, this is probably a place that people have heard about. How do we put this together? So talk about the lodge you guys have there. If somebody was wanting to do a trip, we mentioned maybe May, June is a good time. Describe the lodge a little bit. What can they expect there? Yeah, so uh, I actually, these days, my uh, family sold the lodge and the restaurant in 2021. No, 2022. So I maintained operation of the fly shop and everything is still here as is. And they're doing a great job, but I no longer am like the lodge and the restaurant guy, mm. which has really been like a whirlwind identity crisis sort of routine, right? Because I thought that was going to be my future since I was like three. Right. So, but we've got a great partnership with the owners there and they're making a lot of progress on things that otherwise would not have been done. So we've got a 21 unit motel. We've got a restaurant called the Hungry Trout Restaurant and uh, RF McDougal's pub. And our big thing always has been is bundling them all together for like a group rate that includes your lodging, your guiding, your motel. We're right on the west branch of the Al Sable River. So we are like bar none, the headquarters of the fly fishing routine in the corridor here. We're the only law, uh, riverside lodging establishment. So there's not many other places to stay with river access. There's actually zero. We're the only lodging facility on the river. So we do a, we have a couple stretches of private water as well that are very unique that add a ton of value to the visit that we have exclusive rights toward. Gotcha. Um, and like a lot of lodge routines, you know, we have um, we're right on the river. One thing that separates us apart from a lot of other destinations is we're right outside of Lake Placid and Saranac Lake region, which is like in its own without the fly fishing is a like ridiculously awesome destination. Hmm. So you can come up with people who are not into fishing at all and they're equally as entertained. I don't know if without that, the place would have been successful as it is because it's not just a fly fishing destination peak, you know, in May when everything else is kind of shut down, sure, majority of our business is is fishermen, but we tailored every uh, demographic of visitor that's here. And the Hungry Trout, it's a beautiful property situated right in a, a very quiet area on the river. We're right at the top of a chasm on the Osable. So right behind property, there's like a 300 yard stretch of cascading waterfalls with 50 foot cliffs and it's ridiculous. It's nice. so cool. And the, the the whole property like looks at all of that, all of that stuff the whole time. Yeah. You're just sitting there right on the banks, right off. And it's right yeah. on, like you said, right off of the highway 86, right? That's a pretty yeah. easy, accessible. Yep. It's, a, it's a quiet road. It's a nine acre property. There's a lot of green space. There's a pool with a diving board. Like it's a proper little resort. Yeah. It's a resort. It's a resort. And the food is spectacular. It's an amazing place. It really is. It's hard to speak of it having not having it be in my family anymore. Um, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Because you had right? this thing. That is an interesting thing, right? You had this thing and now it's not in the, in the fly. So remind us again. So the fly shop is in the family and the guiding business. Is that what yeah. you still have? Yep. That's what we still have. We we kept the fishing operation um, 
we still have. So how, how does that, I'm interested in asking this because it sounds like it is pretty visceral thing to you, you know, losing. And I say it for myself because we have a little cabin as well that's right now in the transition where my parents are getting older as well. And we're thinking like, well, is this something we want to make sure to keep in? Because I have three brothers, you know, to keep in the family. Or yeah. is it not that big of a deal? And I feel like it would be an emotional thing to lose it because we've had it our whole lives. Like, is that kind of for you how it felt? Yeah. Oh, man. Absolutely. But it's also like, you know. It's a very romantic notion, you know what I mean? But then when you switch the the lens on it a little bit, growing up there, it's not something I would ever trade, but it's also like a pretty chaotic routine running small business like that in a remote area with two restaurants and, and the whole thing. It's amazing, but it, it has, and just like everything, like it's amazing, but there's some drawbacks and yeah and you you simplified your life probably with with the change oh man and my wife and i we were involved in it for many years and with my children and when you reflect on what type of life you want to provide what do you want to do with your time what did i love about it i loved the community about it i loved the fishing element about it the adirondacks is there's millions of acres of state land. So even though, yeah, we owned this real estate, it's like, yeah, well, that real estate exists and it's up for grabs anywhere anyway. Like we didn't have a private stretch of river. It was it was public river. Yeah. So we really stepped back and said, hey, do we want to be running two restaurants? And just owning one restaurant as a livelihood is like ridiculous, yeah, right? That'd be crazy. And there were two and they were busy. You know, thirty something staff, hmm, wow. then the motel, and yeah, it's a it's a proper operation. You know, yeah. um, the point is, is we we could get, we could pursue our passions and maintain what we had and what we loved about it while living a much simpler life. And and mostly, for me, the contrast of which was I'm able to spend a lot more time with my children, and that was very important to me. That was that was really number one for me. I remember the first like couple months of trying to transition. We tried to buy it and make it happen for a good two years. And uh, within the first couple of weeks, my kids were like so confused that I'd be leaving the house at 6 p.m. to go help some computer system that was down or the line cook didn't show up. Oh, right. And I'd be at the restaurant like behind the line flipping wings like, oh, wow. What am I doing here? Yeah. You know? God. Like, what am I doing here? And my kids would be like, really upset that I was gone. And that just triggered so many memories when I was growing up. I'm like, you know what? This is amazing, but this just, it's something's off. Let it go for the better of the family. I got to let it go. I got to let it go. And I also like my parents, they had grinded 40 years in that. And it, how do we kept it in the family? You know, who'd be stressed out about all that? Yeah. My parents. So, you know, it got to the point where we really sat down, had some hard conversations and we all decided like, Hey, let someone else sing their tune with this thing. We will maintain the fishing element of it. That's a relationship I, I really want to foster into the future and with the new owner. And, and they, are, they have a great vision with the place. And, you know, we started it from like a real mom and pop routine. And maybe, maybe it can grow out of that one day, but it wouldn't have gone out of that without a lot of sacrifice that my family would bear. Right. Gotcha. So, gotcha. yeah. So we went down that and we, we tried for years. It was never really in my folks retirement plan to keep it in the family. And, you know, family business is tricky and it's just not worth it when you're at the Thanksgiving table and there's some like gray matter in the air. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah just to keep you. it, keep it all, keep it clean and uh, turn the page and yeah. carve your own path. I'm still in the fishing scene there more invested than I was in it before because as that transition was happening, as we're selling it, I started getting involved in selling weddings and bigger stuff. And, and next thing I knew, I, I wasn't guiding anymore. I wasn't in that. The reason I loved the property, the property was at the same time kind of taking me away from that. It's time to talk about something that elevates your fishing experience. Stonefly Nets, nestled in the heart of the Ozarks, Ethan, a master craftsman, dedicates his skill to creating the finest wood landing nets. They aren't just tools, they are works of art blending tradition and craftsmanship. 
You know, every time I set my stonefly net in the water, it's not just the fish that catches my eye, it's the beauty of the net itself. These nets are tailored to your fishing style with options to customize the size, handle, and even the intricate wood burls. They are a perfect mix of functionality and aesthetic appeal. And let's talk about the memories. Just like Ethan, many of us cherish fly fishing as a way to connect with our past and creating lasting memories. Stonefly nets are more than just nets. They are part of our story, each cast, and every cast. Are you ready to make fishing trips unforgettable? Visit stoneflynets.com right now and discover the difference a handcrafted net can make. In the great dance between man and nature, having the perfect partner can transform a fleeting moment into a cherished memory. Enter Jackson Hole Fly Company's combo kits, specially curated to complement the rhythm of the river. These kits are your one-step solution to the perfect fly fishing experience. Each combo not only offers an impeccable rod and reel pairing, but also a hand-picked collection of essential fly fishing accessories, making it a truly all-inclusive experience. Whether you're dipping your toes into the world of fly fishing with our beginner-friendly Crystal Creek combo or seeking the pinnacle of performance with the Flat Creek kit, there's something for everyone. And the magic doesn't stop there. Each kit arrives at your doorstep fully assembled, echoing our promise of convenience wrapped in affordable excellence. Make each moment count with Jackson Hole Fly Company's combo kit, every adventure perfectly paired. Find your perfect partner at jacksonholeflycompany.com. Yeah, it sounds like you're in a much better place now than than you were before, which is great to hear because I think the stress, I think all of us can get caught up yeah. in that. Well, dude, a, a few uh, a few podcast therapy sessions and I feel great, you know? Exactly. So this is what we're here for. <laughs> we're here to take you down exactly. that path and you know what I mean? We're all, well, we're also yeah. here to, to provide, uh, you know, some tips and tricks. So let's jump into that before we head out of here in a little bit on um, yeah, the, of course, the of course. Sable. So if somebody's coming there, let's just say, let's just take it to that May, June. So they're in, they're in June. What are a few things you're telling that person before they get there? Maybe some tips to be ready or if they're on the water and they're maybe struggling to catch a fish. What are you telling them? Oh, no question. Um, a lot of the times on our river, you know, we're getting people that are used to fishing bigger pools, riffles, and, you know, whether they're coming up from the Catskills or from Western New York, our river is, uh, we size up everything. So if you're using a size 16 fly in, at home, that same fly on our river is like a 14 or a 12. That helps for a few things. You get a lot more buoyancy and surface area out of the fly to combat the currents from sinking it, right? Mm. They're much easier to fish a little dropper off of. We fish a lot of dry droppers. If you're savvy in that, almost exclusively, I fish dry dropper constantly. Mm. Unless my dropper is just clearly unproductive, then I won't bother with the clunky cast. A lot of it too is we fish a lot closer. We start right at the riverbank and we'll make a 10 foot cast. I tell people start with a fly line, a fly rod's length of line out. So nine or 10 feet of fly line, nine foot leader. And I think I heard, maybe I heard this from Lefty uh, Cray back in the day, Mm -hmm. but your arm, a rod, an equal length fly line and a leader, that's a 20 something foot cast right there. Right. You know, in our river, let's say our river is 50 feet long. So, or 50 feet wide, 75 feet wide. You're almost getting halfway across with 10 feet of fly line out if you're savvy with your uh, rig. So we start really short, we start close, and don't go trampling in on the fish. Because right off the riverbank here, you could step into three foot of water, just right off the bank. Right. So we size up, we're fishing 4X uh, tippets, 3X tippets in the spring, always relative to fly size. And there's always exceptions to this stuff. Like, oh, you told me to fish 3X. I'm like, well, when you switch down to a uh, 14 or 16 elk hair caddis, you kind of want to marry that with the right tippet size. you know. Yep. But I always start with a 9 foot 4X out the back, and then I'll taper down to 5 as needed, and then I can cut back to 4 for just my search patterns and, and cruising around. Gotcha. And what does that dry dropper setup look like? I would be using uh, like an Osable Wolf or a Sable Bomber. A Sable Wolf is just like a Royal Wolf, but with an opossum dubbing. It's real bushy and will pick out the dubbing so it's really buggy. And the wings and the tails are a little bit exaggerated. So it has a lot more uh, it has a lot more surface area and it makes it really effective for skittering. 
We fish a lot of flies with movement, especially in the spring when you're having flies that are hatching and a lot of bugs swimming around. We'll have a, a fish come up and swirl at a dead drifted fly. And I'll tell my client with full confidence to be like, okay, Mike, next, as that comes through, we're going to lift our rod, get tension on the fly and just kind of twitch it across that same spot. And lo and behold, boom. You skitter it or skate it right across the same thing and it just gets demolished, like fish out the water, hook set midair sort of routine, you know. Uh, so we fish a lot of flies with movement. Also, it was just kind of nice because, you know, trout spay and all this stuff is kind of um, and animating mm-hmm. flies using a Euro nymph rig. All of this stuff is becoming a little bit more common, but fishing a moving fly with a big bushy dry while you have your dropper underneath, which is like little beat head emerger of, you know, pick whatever hatch you're in, mm-hmm. uh, little caddis or, you know, we fish a lot of little like birds nests, which is a great Hendrix in them. Mm. But fishing that kind of match the hatch combo, dry and wet uh, with movement, you're kind of covering your bases and you can skitter, um, drop, skitter, drop. So you're kind of mixing up like movement, dead drift, movement, dead drift. But I'll go like a 4X, 4X tippet to like a size 8 or 10 Mayfly attractor like a Sable Wolf. Uh, the Alsable Bomber, very similar. It's a woodchuck tail, ginger and grizzly hackle, a possum dubbing in like a maroon co- or a, yeah, like a maroon color, burnt orange with just a big forward single calf tail wing. It's essentially a salmon bomber. It's just sized down with trout material designed for skating like a stonefly would take off like stoneflies are very active on the surface right yeah. uh so we do a lot of uh or, or a chubby same thing yeah good skittering pattern foam pushes how do water. you skitter describe the skitter i think we all have a picture but how would you describe how, how you would do that for fish you saw fish yeah so rise. yeah skitter you can skitter any direction ideally it'd be downstream so we fish a lot of uh nine foot minimum. I really don't recommend many eight and a half foot rods and, and shorter on our in our corridor. Yeah. A lot of times because the pocket water, you are high sticking a lot and you don't the mending gets complicated because there's really complex currents. So we'll cast out, um we'll let the use our rod tip and the current to get tight to the fly. So there's not a lot of slack on the water. We want to get tight and we want a high rod tip. As you have that high rod tip, the current's pulling on the fly, you're going to have direct contact to the fly. So where you move your tip or your rod, the fly responds and gets a little bit of movement in there. So you kind of let with, as you're that tight to the fly and the current starts pulling the fly, you're kind of swinging it while you're tight to it and it'll bounce on the surface, kind of skate along the top with some animation. And look like an look like an active bug trying to take off. Yep. And we use a ton of desiccant, frog fanny, loon dust, you name it, uh, to maintain that buoyancy, keep the fibers spread. So we yeah, skittering and movement, staying tight, high rod tip. Sometimes your arms all the way in the air, and you're just wiggling that rod tip to animate that fly as it's in the river. Without it sinking. You know, sometimes people try doing that and they keep dragging their fly out of the river. And a lot of times it's because they're not quite high enough. They don't have, they're not tight enough to the fly. So the leader is in the river, which is kind of pulling the fly under. So we want to keep everything high and and move that fly across the surface and and use the tension to dance the fly across. Um, And it's like pocket water is very different than because you can make fish do and respond and and get them to commit in ways that you really can't do in other types of river structure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like those fish are very opportunistic in in pocket water. Yeah, because they have a short window to make a decision to take the fly, otherwise it's gone. No question. They have a very busy environment. They've got fast water both sides, disturbed surface of ri- of the river and. Yeah, so they're really opportunistic, so we can get by. And that's just one way where they can key into a bug. They might not see it, or it might not trigger their instinct if it's just floating, dead drifted. But if you give it some movement, now they see it, and they're like, oh, there's one, you know? Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, so a lot of things come into play, but little pocket water tricks in that realm, like the skitter and the skating and, and using a bigger fly kind of crack the code a little bit. Yeah. I love it. So the skittering is kind of essentially, you're just, yeah, you're imitating, trying to imitate that dry, whether it's a stone fly, maybe dipping it's, you know, eggs or something or a caddis or anything. Right. But you're imitating a fly that's flying away. Sort of thing. 100%. Or they land in the river to dip their eggs and they get stuck. And they're like, I need to get out of here. You know? Right, right, right. When you do that, do you pick a place typically where you say, if somebody comes up, they never fished it before, like, oh, that looks like a good pool. Or do you wait there and wait for rising fish for like heads before you do that? No, man, we just, we fish blind like that a lot. And like, I'll hit the river with no risers, you know, a really nice kind of rough but pooly, like you'll you'll be going along, and be like these are nice pools, and then you'll see like a little pool on one side of the river that you could fit a Volkswagen bug into, mm. you know, yep. and you're like, okay, we're gonna spend some time there. That's the pool, and you'll fish your way to it because you'll find fish in like little two foot troughs all over the place. But you see something like that, uh, and we're blind casting big dries. We're really not waiting for heads. I know a lot of people they like wait for the rise. I'm like, well, were you? just throwing dries. They're like, no, we we didn't see any heads rise. I was like, well, you don't have to on, on this river, right? You don't have to. You can blind cast bigger dries. Like a size 10 parachute Adams is like one of my favorite bucks. Just super classic, floats really well, mimics everything. You can skate it because of the parachute. So I'll blind cast like a parachute Adams and have quite good fishing and I'll spend a whole day. I won't see one fish eat off the surface, but I'll catch 10 fish on the dry. Nice. So that's just another pocket water, you know, benefit. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. So the pocket water, that's the difference. Like you said, this is pocket water. It's a little bit different. Does it look like throughout the year, are you able to fish that dry dropper, you know, starting May all the way through till the end when everything's close up? Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause then, you know, you fish a uh, same kind of thing in the summer, you'll fish a uh, 18 or 20, I fish a little glass head ant or like a small little ant pattern sunk, you know, a couple inches under the surface. I'll fish that underneath a big hopper foam pattern or a chubby. You can fish chubbies all, all season from May all the way into October, right? So we fish a lot of chubbies and purples, blacks, pink. Mm. We use a lot of fat Alberts, pretty classic pattern. We use those in pink. And people laugh at the funny colors, but the difference between pink and yellow is the difference of catching fish or not, right? So we do switch off a lot on like and fish some pretty bright colors just for that. But yeah, dry dropper all season long. And we have so many little brook trout creeks too. Like our summer trout fishing, a lot of times, especially in recent years, is we go fish little brook trout tribs and they're all over a little, you know, size 14 purple chubby. Forget it. Yeah. So that's the one. If you had to pick one throughout the year, the, the chubby, or, or like you said, or the classic, the Osable uh, bombers are, are the ones. Yeah. The bomber, the wolf, the chubby. And, you know, our, our number one seller fly in the shop is a girdle bug, like a tan and black girdle bug. Oh, it is. A girdle, like just straight up like yarn and uh, rubber legs. Or not yarn, but uh, chenille. Is it chenille? Is the body chenille? It's chenille. Yeah, it's chenille. Yeah. And you want you want like a, like a brown and black um, to get that you know, model color. It oh, could be a model. golden. And then, yeah, and you use like a sexy floss, like a really burly, uh, but light. Uh, you don't want to use like a standard rubber because they kind of rot and they don't have the same action. That's right. But like a sexy floss leg. Um, and with the Euro nymphing scene, which we haven't talked about, no. pocket water is like designed for Euro nymphing. We Euro nymph oh, right. a lot. Let's go down that. This is this is great because we've been doing our own Euro schools recently with Pete Erickson. Nice. You know, he won the gold in you know out there in Canada this year, so he's been our guy. But we've been fishing more of the West. You know, we've been out in Idaho. But so this is cool. So it sounds like so some of the similar things. Of course, you got George Daniel and other guys out you know closer to you. But is that something that's an equal you know dries versus Euro? Is that a fifty fifty split oh, throughout the year? Man, I focus on the dry thing because it's like kind of classic. East Coast routine and yep. people like love dry fly fishing and some people oh, I don't nymph you know tell my guide I just want to fish dries it's like okay yeah. I'll do that but you'll also tell your guide that you want to catch a lot of fish right so that's right <laughs> it, it goes both ways so we actually started the Euro nymphing uh, thing in our neck of the woods by hiring uh, Lauren Williams who oh, is okay. a uh, yeah he's on the Masters US fly yep. fishing team that's right uh, he started off as their fly tire. Um, we've actually hired him for a variety of different clinics over the years, like fly fishing, flat water and lock style clinics. 
to uh, fly fish flat water. And so he came up and did a couple Euro nymphing clinics for us. And uh, this was in like 2013. Back when Euro nymphing was like super niche, you could hardly mm-hmm. find a rod to buy. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so he he brought that knowledge to our uh, corridor here. So our model of Euro nymphing was kind of started with with Lauren Williams. Also one of those just OG guys who's not in it for any other reason than he has like a, a super methodical mind. You know what I mean? He has not, it's not about, you know, let me do this for Instagram or, or, or even let me do this for anybody else. It was just, he had a really awesome philosophy on, and just the way he lived with his fishing routine. So he would come up and introduce the thing and we'd go out back for a clinic, a little demonstration. You know, we'd get 10, 12 guys out back and be like, all right, guys, Lauren's going to show us what this is all about. And in a 30 yard stretch, he would catch you know, 10 fish in yeah. like minute in minutes. And we, we would be floored. This was back when, before you like, we're used to that kind of thing. We're like, right. what is happening? Like, this is nuts. <laughs> I've never caught a fish behind that rock in my life, stuff like that. So, and just the pocket water dynamic for those people who do your own imp, which is a lot of anglers now, uh, just having really broken up river helps with the Euro nymphing thing and a long rod and we're tight lining anyway. Now we just have a system that's like, it's perfect. The system's designed for it. It's tailored for it. It's so cool. So it's probably not tailored as much. It's it's perfect for dry. I mean, you're painting the pit, you know, these big boulders, big like pools. So you got the dries, you got the, the nymphing, the Euro nymphing, probably not the best for if you wanted to swing like trout spay swinging flies. Is it not the best for that? No, we have a couple sections where like, you know, there's a handful of transition zones where the pocket water does pool and riffle out. The river is about 35 miles long. Most of it is public. So there's a lot of river. You know what I mean? So you can definitely find those those pools. But yeah, it's definitely not like, it's not like run after run and you the next bend will be a nice run and riffle. The next bend is a run and riffle. It's not like that. But there are some, but you kind of have to be familiar with what one's fishing at, what flow. You know, it's a little more nuanced of where you want to go to do that sort of thing. And we have those spots. Like we're, we're pointing people in those directions all the time. Uh, a lot of our guides swing, we swing a lot for salmon and, uh, a lot of people on the trout spay routine as well. So those spots do exist. What Uh, are the salmon swinging for salmon? What is that? Uh, the Adirondacks have a lot of landlocked salmon. Well, back up. It has some landlocked salmon. The numbers yeah. are really low. It's challenging. It's not something we really guide or promote. Right. These are Atlantic salmon. Yeah. Landlocked Atlantics. Yeah. It's not like, ooh, landlocked Atlantic. It's like, no, not really. It's like, uh. But you could hook, are people actually targeting them where they can be like, hey, I'm going to go try to catch one of these? Yeah. And sometimes they might. It's one of those things. It's same thing. Like you think the trout numbers and cold water fisheries are challenged, like there's nothing more challenged than a salmon fishery, you know? Well, and I always compare it to, and we've done a few Atlantic salmon episodes, but I always think of the, um, you know, steelhead, because steelhead can be, and, and even musky, right? Some of these species are like, you're like one, you might get one hookup or maybe none. I mean, is, is this kind exactly. of even lower, lower chance of, than that? Exactly. Exactly. Some years there isn't even a run, you know? Right. So it's really challenging, but it gives us an excuse to swing without having to drive five hours, you know? So. Yeah. And are they, are these fish migrating? Are they using like the lake as like their ocean sort of Exactly. Thing? Yeah. yeah. Lake Placid, is that Lake Placid? No, Lake Placid's actually a, it's a really great lake trout lake. And there's no like big inlet or outlet of it. It's a really deep lake. We fish that and uh, some of our guides really fish that for just huge lake trout, which is badass. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, cool. yeah, so we have kind of the whole thing. And then the last few years, our ice fishing thing has just taken off we've got a major ice fishing operation which is funny because it's so polar opposite from fly uh but i'm like i'm like addicted to it man it's like embarrassing (laughs) so where are you and and, well i think well maybe we'll just touch on this and we'll leave the rest of the story for our next one we do here but tell me where where is the ice fishing what 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 are you fishing what why Uh, i mean there's thousands of lakes in the adirondacks like everywhere and uh 
the trout lakes are generally closed for ice because they're trying to protect the trout species, which are challenged. So we fish a lot for lake trout, pike, bass, that sort of thing. And there's like dozens of lakes. And it's, you know, to go from like a busy season with a, with a fly shop and doing a ton of guide trips and tourism and you name it, to be sitting in an ice shanty on a, on a lake like all by yourself. Is, yeah, with a heater. With a heater, yeah. And it's just so calm and it's amazing. And it is fishing. Like fishing's fishing. You're, you know, you're dialing in the habits of fish, trying to get them to eat something yeah, they otherwise wouldn't have, it. right? So it's it's still doing it. It's all the same. It's just a very different environment and quiet and very peaceful routine. And we guide that a lot. Like we're very, our guide service for that is really busy. Oh, it is. Is that right? Right yeah. now it's January. Is, is that going into February, March? Is this time right now, ice fishing time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We've been guiding uh, almost every day since uh, end of December. And what are they catching? What's the main species? Uh, this year we've been on a lake trout binge. Yeah. It differs every year. A lot depends how every how all the ice freezes. And I notice more and more fishermen as a whole, like just like, oh, uh, trout season's over. Now I'm going to steelhead fish. Oh, steelhead fishing is too cold. It's five degrees. Now what do I do? Ice fishing is becoming like way more popular. I'm seeing so many more people get into it because it fills in the blank. For now, we're fishing and guiding like full on year round starting Four years ago, when we started the ice fishing thing. No kidding. And are those clients? Are those clients um, like a mix of fly anglers in the summer, or are they mostly people that are maybe just conventional type fishermen? Uh, both, totally both. And it, we're we're pulling both. We're pulling conventional people through ice fishing into fly because we have these oh, conversations right. in the shanty. Sure. We're pulling fly into ice because once you get into it, you realize like it's just another technical avenue to catch fish and learn fish and. More gear, more equipment, more yeah. strategy. And it's it's just like it is the same exact spectrum of why we like fly and, and spin and just fishing as a whole. It's the same exact thing. It's just in a different element with new stuff. So we have we've we've been able to guide, you know, we're really like full season, all year, uh, all things fishing. And uh, you know, I don't have to worry about what's on the menu next week or right. fry, frying wings or <laughs> you name it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Nice. Well, this is good, Evan. I think that, you know, I feel like we could sit here and definitely like uh, some of these we could chat for a long. I, I want to, hopefully we'll bring you back on and talk more about some of the stuff you have going. But um, yeah, I just want to leave there. Maybe give a, any, anything else you want to miss if somebody's planning a trip to the uh, Sable, you know, this year or next, anything else you would tell them to get ready for that? Yeah, I'd get ready for a good hang. Yeah, there you That's go. That's really what it's, that's what that's that is what it's about, you know. You mentioned it earlier, what Rachel said, and yep. we always have that conversation. And uh, we didn't touch base on it much, but it's the hungry trout is built around having a hang. The fish we've had, like we've had peak seasons where the fishing sucks, just like every fishery, and they're great trips, you know, because it's it's all about the hang, one hundred percent. So that's um. Just get ready for a good hang. And if that's your expectation, then the fishing conditions and all that, they can be pretty and it won't matter. It's all good. Perfect. All right. I love that we leave it there with the hang. And uh, we'll send everybody out to hungrytrout.com if they have questions. Yeah. Hungrytrout.com, hungrytroutflyshop.com. And uh, we'll be here. All right. Awesome, Evan. Hey, I appreciate the time today. I, this has been one I've been wanting to do for a while again, like I said, but we, I think that there's still another one out there. So we'll hopefully get you on, but I appreciate your time uh, today and we'll talk to you soon. No, oh, Dave, my pleasure, man. Thank you so much. If you want to take this conversation further, you can head over to our private Facebook group right now and you can ask questions, connect with the community there. That's wetflyswing.com slash Facebook right now. Check it out. Also, would love if you had a chance to check out our school program, wetflyswing.com slash school of fishing. If you want to find out what currently we have going for schools this year and, uh, and some of the courses and content, that is the best place to go right now. And we actually have one of those schools going, the wetflyswing.com slash Euro Clinic. Check that out if you're interested in nipping. Okay, let's do a quick shout out before we get out of here. A quick listener shout out and want to thanks, uh, thank you and everyone out there for listening. Our follow up today and our shout out is to Mike. Mike says he follows us on the player app and he really loves the format, especially like the Josh Greenberg uh, episode and segment as he is a Michigan guy. 
who primarily fishes the Asable. So there you go, the Asable, the Asable. We got them both going now. We've checked out two of the epic lodges, and now we're going to keep going. If you have a river you want us to check out or a guest or topic anything and you want to get a shout out on this podcast you can do it right now send me an email right now dave at wetflyswing.com doesn't matter when it is shoot it off and uh, and i will respond and let you know uh, when we can put that together for you that's the easiest way to uh, help us help you and, uh, and it's just fun to do. So check it out right now. Just send me a message. All right, I'm gonna get out of here. I hope it is late in the night. So I'm gonna hope you have a great evening, great morning, or great afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Appreciate you for supporting the podcast and I'll talk to you soon.